Welcome to the world of real entertainment. You are about to experience the first volume of All the King's Men, a revealing look into the private life of Elvis Presley. Watch for the release of future tapes in this exciting series, coming soon on home video. Elvis Presley, from his early life to the day he died, relied on a handful of confidants known as the Memphis Mafia. These five men guarded Elvis, kept his secrets, and preserved his memories. Here for the first time, on camera and on the record, they share their private accounts of life with a legend, the stories of all the king's men. Exciting! I thought, God, you know, I, it's unbelievable. And it's my cousin here, you know, and he's he's on the radio. You know, I mean, it just was uh, the feeling. It's just really hard to describe. It really is. You know, I mean, you you, you got somebody that that's, that's done something in the family. Because I'm gonna be honest with you, nobody had. And he was hanging away, and I I was amazed that here's this guy that I knew from school, and that. Everybody thought was weird. <laughs> it's up on the truck entertaining everybody, and he saw me and he went like this. I grew up with Elvis Presley. I grew up and became a middle aged man with Elvis Presley, and then all of a sudden, it's over. I knew the drugs had him, and they were going to get him, and there was no turning back, and I felt sick. I was in the living room when she came in, and uh, I said, Elvis, this is Priscilla, Priscilla, this is Elvis. And I said, I just had these visions of all of us just going to prison for life. I, you know, I was scared to death. She wasn't even 14 yet. I was jumped up, went in and got this assault rifle. I think it was AK-47 or something. He came out and put it in my hand. I said, Sonny, go kill Mike Stone. Do it for me, go kill him. We were all like brothers more than, more than anything else. The thing about him, he was such a part of our lives. You know, we just, uh, everything, I guess outside of my father, he was the closest thing I had. I went in to the house and called Graceland and I said, what is going on? And his first words to me is, Marty, he's gone. The door opened and Dr. Nick, he walked out and he got these tears running down his eyes. And he reached and grabbed me and he said, he's gone. He said, do you want to see him? And I said, I don't think so. We were part of something unique. We, did, we didn't even realize what we were a part of until after it was gone. And uh, we spent a lifetime with a legend from the time we were kids until we were grown men. And uh, it was a hell of an experience. I'll tell you how different Elvis was. When I first moved to Memphis from New York in, in 52, I first went to Central High School. And we'd be sitting up in the stands, and you'd see the strange looking guy walking around the track at Hodges Field or Crump Stadium, wherever the, the games were being played. And people used to point at him and laugh because he dressed different in loud clothes and his hair, you know, was longer. And I used to dress the same way because that's the way we dressed in New York. What sealed our fate forever, I'm sure, 
I came into the, between classes, I went to the bathroom one day, and uh, I saw these three guys and Elvis back in the corner. Two of them were holding him, one guy had the scissors. Says, yeah, we're going to, Elvis was different. He wore the long hair and yeah, all of us had crew cuts. Yeah. And I walked in, looked around, what's going on, boys? We're going to cut a little hair off this boy here, you know. I said, yeah. Well, I said, uh, he don't look like he wants it cut off to me. He said, no, he don't, but we do. And I said, well, if you cut his, you're going to cut mine, and I ain't got too damn much up here to cut. <laughs> and they looked at me to see if I was serious, and they saw that I was serious, and they, they let him go. Now, the story, these were football players. They weren't football players. These were, these were just redneck dumbasses. Well, I saw him the first time. I took a girl to see him when he came to Tucson Rodeo Grounds. And man, it was just pandemonium. And he drives in, and I've... She's been cool so far, all these other kids and carrying on and on. She's been real cool. And he comes in and he steps out and he falls down to his knees and about dust like that. Boy, and there went my girl. Like, whoa, hey. All of them were trying to get to him. We used to have these talent shows at school. Elvis got up and uh, sang Old Ship with his guitar, you know. And I had this little combo. I played the trumpet and had the uh, guitar player and the whole bit. And, I thought we were something, and this, this kid gets up and sings this little old, old ship thing. And, but they loved it. See, that's what's different between today's musicians and, uh, and guys in those days. Mm -hmm. Today, you got to do a showcase, which Lamar knows, and uh, he, he would have had a tough time making it. Yeah, when exactly we first started right. out, it was just straight. But some, something happened on stage one day where he moved a leg or something, and a, a little scream came out. So that's how this whole act evolved. <laughs> 21-year-old Elvis Presley, the son of Mississippi sharecroppers, returned to his hometown of Tupelo a millionaire. In the three years since graduating from high school, he became an international sensation, was the object of fanatical adoration by his audiences, and by the end of the year would have five number one singles on the pop chart, including Heartbreak Hotel and Hound Dog. His sensual stage presence earned him the dubious nickname of Elvis the Pelvis and the loyalty of the emerging youth culture. His parents, Vernon and Gladys Presley, were also caught up in their son's meteoric rise to fame. He had made his first demo record as a present for his adoring mother. As he told it later, uh, it was for his mama's birthday, and then later he told it it was for Christmas. And uh, really, I think, like I say, it was just uh, to hear how he sounded. And as soon as he finished and got it and all, uh, he took it and let her listen to it, you know. And of course, she praised everything he'd done, you know. She said, oh, it's great and all this, you know. And, of course, his daddy, he was somewhat a little different. And he said, well, I've never heard a guitar player yet that ever made a damn dime, so. Uh, <laughs> she was the strongest. She was the strong. In fact, Gladys was the lead of the family, period. When she when, got mad, know. she had her. Ooh. She would take a whole lot. And then when she Ooh. got mad, she'd strike. She used to brood a lot. That's where yeah. Elvis got his brooding. He was well, I, I think she worried so much about him. Uh, by him being, you know, an only child and her losing one and, and not really being able to have another one. And uh, she just uh, was so protective of him. But she was really, uh, uh, most of the time, a uh, real up type woman, you know. I mean, things didn't get her down that much. She was a loud talker and Vernon was real quiet. Well, he was until he got to a point and then he yeah. was a hitter, you know, yeah. and, and that... He abused her real bad a couple yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple yeah. times, yeah. That's, that's a big thing. You know, people who, who have talked about Elvis since he died, a big thing about him calling home because she wanted to check on him. But, you know, as Billy has told us in the past, because that, he wanted to check. that a big part of it was him checking to be sure that she was okay, she was okay. Uh -huh. that Vernon didn't hit her. See, I think that's where Elvis got his, I think he got his warmth from her. Yeah. I also think he got his temper from her. The worst fights that... And Red knows about this, and Gladys and Elvis getting a fight. It was, yeah, yeah. and it always happened over the dinner table. We, I remember Grace exactly right. I scared remember. me half the day. Lamar. There just frozen, man. I was just scared to death because I didn't know what was going to happen. Boy, it just—I mean, they were in each other's face. And we'd been back home about, oh, I guess a week from when we finished Y'all Eyes Rock, and I was sitting beside Elvis, and she had a big plate of tomatoes and bacon and Crowder peas, and I think you were at the table and. I'm sitting there, and Gladys said something. Well, Elvis said, uh, no, that's wrong. Well, she started. And then Vernon said something. He, he turned around to his dad and said, you don't need to say any more. Well, they started screaming. And Gladys picked up a plate full of tomatoes. 
and <laughs> just threw them all up, Vernon. Oh, it just, it, I mean, tomatoes went everywhere. I grabbed the crowd of peas, and I was going to head under the table. I said, there's no other way out here. I said, somebody's got to eat here. You know, <laughs> it really got scary. I mean, it got really, I mean, it scared me to death. And that's the first time I'd ever seen a knockdown drag out like that. I mean, they were really, man. That's why he was so, he was so like her in that <clears throat> respect. When he lost his temper, he exploded. I didn't exploded. care who, uh, he didn't care who was in the room. He didn't care what he said, what he said about you, what he said about your family, what he said about your kids. And 30 seconds after he finished, he was sorry. He knew, but well, he that was, get over it quick. But that was a part of our relationship. I mean, that was the way our relationship was with each other. That uh, you allow somebody you care about to do, to do that. To let the the only out. person that I've never known that really, when he got mad, it was like a dark cloud enveloped everything, and everyone around was affected by it. He may not be angry at you, he may be angry at him, but his anger was so forceful that it just, you couldn't wait for him to get out of it because he, it was bad. He could push the buttons harder than anybody alive. I mean, he knew how to push the buttons, and when he pushed them, I mean, I've seen us, I've read myself, Sonny, Marty, Bill, I've seen us all double up. I mean, I, he's doubled us up in pain. Teenage hearts across the country checked into Heartbreak Hotel in 1958 as Elvis is drafted into the Army. Hi. Hi, Mr. President. Uh, you saw the square. You saw the square. And our man, true faith and allegiance. Our man, true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. Elvis is now marching to a different beat. Not only is he leaving behind a phenomenal recording career, but also a string of top ten movie hits, among them King Creole, Love Me Tender, and Jailhouse Rock. When Elvis surrenders his trademark long hair, the shearing makes the front pages of newspapers and magazines around the world. Posted to Germany, Private Presley is assigned to a tank unit, but would find he can't escape the assault of a photo-hungry press corps. Even with constant attention, Elvis politely answers reporters' questions with a diplomat's flair. Miss uh, the singing career very much, or are you enjoying this army life? Uh, I miss my singing career very much. Uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, the army is a pretty good deal, too. Elvis hated being there because he thought his career was over with. I mean, you know, he had this fast rise to the top all of a sudden in three years and then bam, in the army. Sure. You become a movie star, the greatest record selling uh, singer ever, and then bam, here you are in Germany. Well, on the post and everywhere else, he was a soldier. He did his job. I mean, he stood up in the cold up on the border at, in, right. in the wintertime in Grafenbeer freezing weather, sitting in a jeep as a scout, watching the Russians on the other side of the fence. But when he came home, we heard all, you know, about how much he, hey, I hate this shit, Colonel Parker, I sound a bitch, you know, this, that, and the other. Oh, I know. But then when he went back to the post, he was a perfect soldier again. Man, we used to go to Frankfurt to, uh, to the nightclubs. Elvis really, he would, anytime he got a chance to go around entertainers or the business itself, he would go because it would remind him of what he did. And we were over there to this club one night, and this, uh, this girl was a, uh, what do you, when they twist all, what do they, they? Contortionist. A contortionist, as she was, you know. And later on, Elvis went up and saw her and got back in the car, you know, Red and I just, our tongues were out of there, <laughs> panting, wanting to know what went on. I said, how was, she was, he said, boy, you cannot believe what I was. Man, yeah, well, we pried on him for two days trying to get what went on in there. It was just, it was unbelievable. Said, Things like that would happen to him. We didn't have it. It didn't happen to us, and we just thought it was great. I said, did she do all? He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Girls were always coming to the house. So, and I, like, I didn't speak any, I had learned a few German words, like, du schlafen mit mir. <laughs> <laughs> What's that mean? <laughs> the important one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this one real cute little girl came to the door and she started speaking. She couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak German. And I finally said, right, let's get to the chase. Do schlafen mit Elvis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
He hadn't come home from the base yet, so I sneaked her up to the room and put her in the room. Yeah. And, and in about 10 minutes, I always came home and I said, Elvis, I, I left a little present in your room up there. Oh, really? And he went up there, and three or four hours later, they came out. Right near to ear. We, we would go on leave to Paris, and uh, we would go to what the, to the, over to the Lido and see the Lido show. And the Lido girls were actually a group of girls called the Bluebell Girls. And after the show, Elvis invited them all over to the hotel. So about seven, about four or five o'clock in the afternoon, this guy called my room and I answered and I said, "Hello." And he said, "Sir," he said, "Listen to me." And I said, "What do you want to tell me?" He said. Y'all have all the women over there. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, what women? He said, the dancers. We can't start the show. And so I went to Elvis' room, and I opened his door up, and it looked like a harem. And I mean, they were just, oh. we're talking everywhere. You know, I had stepped on four or five of them trying to get to the room. And it was like a parade. W girls were walking through with their stockings around their necks and <laughs> carrying their purses and their clothes. And we loaded all five limousines up to take them back over to the hotel. It was really. I think this is a good place to bring up something. Because I know that every one of us, and even the guys that ain't here, have heard it since Elvis has died about all, all the stuff he did for us and how much money we made and this and that. I don't think with the exception of two or three who will go unnamed that any of us were there for the money. If oh, we were there the money, for the never, money, if been the money would never stay. We, yeah. Nobody would have been there because there was none. And we didn't complain. I mean, every once in a while, somebody would say something, but for the most part, we didn't complain because we loved being there. And it wasn't just be with Elvis. We had such a tremendous strong camaraderie, camaraderie and, and relationship, yeah. all with each other and with Elvis and him with us, that, hey, the best thing I can say is that I wish that kind of relationship on everybody. In March of 1960, Elvis is discharged from the Army and returns home to his adopted city of Memphis, a hero. The time overseas has matured Elvis and given him a suave new look, yet his music and his career has stayed on his mind. You know, you think rock and roll is dying. Some people say it is. A lot of people say it is, man, but I'll I, I tell you, uh, it has changed some. The music itself has changed. It's it, it progressed quite a bit, I, I think. It's better. Uh, I think it's getting better all the time, you know, because the the, uh, the arrangements are getting better. They're adding more instruments and, you know, so forth. It's getting better, but in 1956, when I first started out, I was hearing the same thing, that rock and roll is dead, it's dying out. I'm not saying that it won't die out because it may be dead tomorrow completely. I don't know. I wish I did not Meeting him at the train station is manager Colonel Tom Parker, who has tightly controlled Elvis's every career move since 1955. Back home at Graceland, the next chapter of Elvis's life has begun. He will soon star in his fifth film, G.I. Blues, and is now involved with a dark-haired beauty he met while in Germany, the young daughter of an army colonel, Priscilla Beaulieu. But I, mean, I remember the first time I met her, you know, I'd already come back from Germany, and she came after me in Germany. And he couldn't wait to show her to me there at Graceland. The first time I saw her in the kitchen, yeah. he stood her down and come got me and said, I want to introduce you to Priscilla Bowyer. Uh, what do you think? I said, uh, what do you expect me to say? I think he hit a home run there, son. And, you know, he, was, he had that wood tip cigar. Yeah, I think so, too, man. You know? <laughs> she was diaper trained by then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hell, he had underwear older than she was, yeah, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay, let's get back to an interesting thing here. Uh, Priscilla's come to the States, you know? And then Elvis is making these movies with all these gorgeous leading ladies, which leads us to Ann Margaret, who, and all the, everybody here will agree, was one of the sweetest, yeah. nicest, Let's sexiest see, yeah, women that we've ever met. I mean, a whole lot yeah. of fun. In fact, uh, it was a real toss-up at that time between Ann Margaret and Priscilla. And Priscilla knew it too, see? And so she even goes so far as to lighten her hair and get the same look that Ann Margaret did during that time. I mean, that's how intimidated she was by that situation. And she had every right to be. She, she did, yeah. I remember one night we were in the kitchen at Graceland one night. 
And the intercom buzzes. I pick up the intercom, and it's Elvis. He and Priscilla were upstairs. Get this bitch an airplane. I'm shipping her ass home. I said, OK. And I hung the phone. To, I told the guys Lamar was standing there. Lamar says, oh, here she goes. <laughs> yeah. Wing south, yeah. And, and then about 15 minutes later, the intercom rings again, and he says, forget the plane ticket. I said, OK. See, the whole thing was about Ann Martha. And, oh. she, and she confronted him with it. And first he denied it, and then he turned his defense into an offense. Good he offense said, is look, a great defense, yeah. he said, I didn't do nothing, but if you're going to accuse me, you can get your damn ass out of here. And that's when he's a pretty good actor. And he picked up that damn phone, and he said, get this bitch an airplane. I'm packing her bags, and she's gone. Well, it was just too too obvious, you know. I mean, yeah. you, she, she was reading all this stuff, you know, and, and everything else. And, of course, he was saying, you know, you're going to read all these things about me with every co-star yeah. and every woman you know, that's around. So he could cover it that way. And his next thing for not coming home was they're holding me under contract here. That, I heard that until, oh, Lord. Another time there when he did this similar thing was on Rocker Place when they got into it up there. And you could hear him. We were down in the living room in a long hallway. And they had the end bedroom way back there. And you could hear it, the hollering, the yelling. And what he was doing was he was taking all of her clothes out of the closet and throwing them on the bed, throwing them on the bed. He, and he said, get your stuff packed, get out. And he came out there and sat down in the living room. And all of a sudden, he broke into a grin. He said, I think I got her thinking right now. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I think she's OK now. I said, well, you, I, Elvis, did you tell her to get out? He said, I sure the hell did. I took her clothes, threw them on the bed, told her to pack them and get out. Oh, well, Mr. Macho. And I said, I said, is that, do you mean it? He says, no, I don't mean it, Sonny. He went back in a few minutes and said, now, put them back up and unpack. You're not going, but that's what'll happen the next time you challenge me on this. So he, he used reverse psychology oh, man, many he times. Can have her dancing on a yo-yo. Yeah. I've never seen anything girl, like it. This is a young girl. Huh? You got to remember, this is a young girl. I mean, she turned 21 after being with him for like five or six years. And she was a young girl at that time, so she was scrambling, like with Ann Margaret, mm -hmm. a very polished woman, actress, and here's this young girl scared to death she's gonna lose this man. The, the thing with, with Elvis and Ann was I, the biggest thing that broke it off were, were the fact of their careers. See, Elvis had a hard time accepting, you know, Equality. The, it, yeah, it, that's right. And so he wanted a woman, you know, basically like Priscilla, who, who he could pretty much raise himself, you know, the way he wanted her. And Ann wasn't willing to give her career up, you know. So uh, I think that was the biggest thing. It really broke that whole situation off. After four years of living together, Elvis Presley and Priscilla Beaulieu exchange wedding vows in Las Vegas at the Aladdin Hotel. The groom has just completed his 25th movie and has now sold over 100 million records worldwide. Elvis's father, Vernon, kisses his new daughter-in-law for luck. America's most eligible bachelor is now a married man. Elvis should never have been married. He loved femininity. He just was not meant to be married because he was but supposed he said, to have the women. The colonel said, you know, that, that you got an image to, to, to keep up. And he said, uh, you've been with her for a while and, and she's not a, a lot of people anymore, right yeah. and a little she's not a little girl and the people know it and he said this oh, is a good time but, but I think he turned to the colonel after Colonel Beaulieu put the pressure on him because I think he called no, I'm just saying what Elvis told oh, me in later yeah. years this is what he told me that the colonel actually you know told him it was time for him to get married. Day, see he and I when we got home we had a bad bad argument and he said look you got to understand I'm under a lot of pressure and I, I still, you know, I said, yeah, 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 what kind of pressure? Uh, just like that. And he said, they're pressuring me into marrying Priscilla. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean, who's pressuring you? He said, her father. They threaten to sue me if I don't marry her, breach a promise. And I looked at him. My first reaction, I wanted to say, you know, pardon the language, I wanted to tell him, tell him to go fuck themselves, you know? And... I held back. I didn't say nothing. I still, still was in that mood. And he says, 
you know, I'm going to have to do it. And by then, I'm sure he had already talked to the colonel. Let's face it, from the time Elvis became famous until the very end, he never at any point stopped seeing other women, including with Priscilla. Exactly right. never stopped. He was having her around when he wanted her around, see? And if he didn't want her around and he wanted to stay away for three or four weeks, Priscilla had to stay there by herself until he wanted to come home. I mean, he really got her, and as she got older, she gained more independence because when she was younger, it upset her that she might lose him. But now she, she needed male companionship, well, and if she, she wasn't getting it from him for whatever reason, whatever reason she wasn't getting it from him, he, you know, all of a sudden she's seeing attractive men that are interested in her, and so things started happening. Priscilla so started taking... Uh, lessons from Mike Stone in L.A. Karate lessons. And I was very impressed with Mike Stone because he'd had like 93 or 96 bouts as a black belt and he never lost one. He had never lost one bout. And uh, first, he was teaching her. And it just turned into something else, you know? And it evolved into an affair. Mike Stone was married at the time. It broke up his marriage. So it, it, it just went from bad to worse there for a little while. Happen, you know? They just yeah. they happen. That's, you know... And he always started talking to us about this guy breaking up his home. And he all of a sudden started losing it and saying things like, God, you don't understand. And he's saying this and that. And then I was sat down and he said, Sonny, get down, get down. So I was at the foot of the bed and I got down on my knees. He said, come here. And he put his hands out. And I took his hands and he said, look at me, look at me, man. And I, I started looking at him. He was trying to give me suggestion by concentrating on, you gotta kill him, Sonny. You gotta do it, man, you gotta do it. He's breaking up my family. Very low key, and I'm fighting. I said, no, 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 Elvis. He said, Sonny, you can do it. I know you can do it, man. He's done this. My baby, my wife, I don't have him anymore. And I said, Elvis, no, no. And Red's over at boys, Elvis, come on. Elvis jumped up, went in and got this assault rifle. I think it was AK-47 or something. And he came out, or either Thompson machine guns, one of the two, and he came out and put it in my hand. I said, Sonny, go kill Mike Stone. Do it for me. Go kill him. I said, no. He had lost her, and he knew it. Elvis was hurt, and he was hurt deep. Mm -hmm. But a, a whole lot of the hurt was his ego. Oh, yeah. The fact that Priscilla left Did him. to him. Oh, who? And not him, you know, because uh, all the other times, he, oh, saying, weeded the woman out. And this time, it wasn't. She left him, boy, oh, and that, no, was, no. A, that, was, that was a heck of a blow to his ego. And, and the, night that, the night that he found out for sure, either like Red had told him or something, when he knew it, Priscilla was in town. She was downstairs eating. Elvis got someone to tell her he needed to see her to come up. They did it. She came up there, and he didn't rape her, but he took her and, was in, and remarked her about Mike Stone, can he do this, so, so forth and so on. And then when she went back down and she was right, Pat was there, his wife and Judy, and her face was real flushed, real red. And she said, he just took me up there. Scared me to death at first, but he just took me. In L.A., I, I came out there on a visit. I was out there on business. I came up to the house. For some reason, he was outside, and I got out of the car. And the first words out of his mouth was, Marty Priscilla's going to leave me. And I looked at him, and I said, well, I was... I know it hurts, but let me ask you something. I mean, you know why she, she's probably going to do this. And I said, are you going to change doing what you're doing? And he looked at me and said, I ain't changing for nobody. I said, well, as much as it hurts, you're going to have to live with it. And he looked at me and says, yeah, you know, I guess you're right. Disillusioned with Hollywood in the late 60s, Elvis returned to his first love, live performances. On the eve of his first appearance in New York, Elvis seems nostalgic about his music career. I, I would like to think that we've, we've improved ourselves over the past 15 years. How about musically? That's what I mean. I mean musically and vocally and everything. I'd like to think that I've improved over the past 15 years. Elvis. Attendance breaking appearances in Las Vegas, a TV special, and four more hit records bring Elvis back from the brink of becoming a rock and roll has been. He's quite aware of the thin line between the person and the performer. Are you satisfied with the image you've established? Uh, uh, well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. So. How close does it come? 
How close does the image come to the land? It's, 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 it's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. Yeah. You can't imagine the pressure and, and, and everything involved in, in being in Las Vegas for four solid weeks working, another week to rehearse, two more weeks after it was kind of playtime, but two shows a night, seven days a week, nobody does that. No. And uh, that might kind of explain some things to people, the pressure that somebody like that is under, and we're under, uh, not only with our families, but constant pressure from him, from the colonel, from everywhere. Sure. And from the audience, and from everything that's going on. It, it's, it, you cannot imagine. You know, the, the, la the early parts of Vegas he liked in 69, 70, 71. After that, about 73, four and five, man, he hated Vegas. He could not stand it. It drove him crazy. It was just, it was so hard, you know. Sure. He always had to have a challenge and uh, the cities, the tours, turned out to be the same cities over and over and over and over. And then Vegas, the same stage over and over and over and over. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, what do you think really killed him? I said, I thought it was you know, terminal apathy, you know. He just bored, he, bored to death. He became so apathetic that he became a parrot of himself. He really, it was sad because yeah, he would sad. go, he would go on stage and go in automatic pilot. Well, one night he comes out and he was, he, was, he was wound up before the show. He was a, a, not in a good mood. He's over on my side of the stage, and uh, he throws a scarf to this lady. She grabs it and throws it back, and it just floated right down on him. And instead of taking, you know, smiling at her and going to give it to somebody else, he it pissed him off. He went and he, right, right to her, and she took it right back to him. And she's just drunk and laughing. Oh, oh, oh this is great! I'm getting all this attention. Well. He's driving in with a wall, and I'm standing there behind the curtain. I said, oh, shit. I could see this, this wasn't going well, because he'd forgotten about the show, and he got a picture of the scarf back and forth with this lady. And he finally, boy, he read it back and just he threw, threw the hell out of it and walked, walked off. He thought about this the whole damn show while he's doing it. It was a terrible show. And after the show, we got out and said, why the hell didn't you come out there and stop that, friend? I said, Stop a lady from throwing a scarf? I mean, I'm supposed to walk out in the middle of the show and chew a lady out who, you know, who's doing nothing but throwing a scarf. He said, God damn it, don't, you know, don't talk back to me. He, he, he got quiet. In a few minutes, he come out, I mean, at a very fast pace. And he, he always had that, that gun. He was, he was trying to pull this gun out. He said, God damn it, don't you ever talk to me in front of the <coughs> security like that. So I just, I just turned around, leaned on the bar, you know, when he, he came right, right in front of me. And I'm waiting, you know, if he's going to do something, he, he's going to get one shot. And that's, you know, when Sonny, Sonny saw this, he stepped in. I said, come on. I mean, that was, you know, what's wrong? What is wrong here, you know? And he said, I'm not having anyone speak to me like he spoke to me. And it, it was already starting to settle down because he knew if he didn't, he was going to be in a lot of trouble. And Red left the bar, went into the, the kitchen. We got a stand-up freezer refrigerator boy and he hauled off all of a sudden and hit that freezer door and big dent just went in it you know and uh he said damn it what is this about i've had it i've had it so there again was the thing where elvis could push you to a point and he knew when to stop well he, he got handy with a gun there in vegas <laughs> there was some funny instances uh the, the breakfast table of course, breakfast was like five or six in the afternoon. It was kind of up, up three steps yeah, off to the dining room. And we all, you know, all the guys come in there, you know, talking loud. He was at the end of the table, and he wanted uh, our attention. He said, <laughs> hey. And everybody just kept talking like Lamar usually does. Just yak, 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 yak. Back and forth, he said, hey. It's just nobody, he everybody talking, ignored nobody him. Everybody ignored him. He took the gun and said, boom, boom, boom. And you can hear the bullets ricocheting around <laughs> up there. Everybody hit the floor like Lamar grabbed his heart. Last table, we it was that thick. We dived under it. I ran into you. We hit like this, looking up. And 
But you hear those bullets ricochet. It would rain, though. It would rain up there, and the rain. Oh yeah, the, after that, after that, it was like a, you know, you could put your flowers under there and keep them in alive. In the hotel, said we don't understand what's going on. They, they said, why is it? They said, we just didn't put the stuff up there right. So they had to go, re they had to go retar it. You know, and they never could understand why. It was leaking. It'd take off sometimes about a day or so, and then we'd start going around the strip and, and seeing other acts, you know. And so we went over to the landmark, and there was Jimmy Dean, and uh, the Imperials were backing. So something happened where Elvis invited them, and uh, I, I, I guess Jimmy Dean was invited. I don't know, but I know he told the guys, y'all come on over to the hotel. So the, the Imperials and Jimmy Dean arrived there, and we're all sitting around talking and everything, and time's going on and on. And they're out there a little over an hour now, and uh, no Elvis. Imperials didn't mind. I mean, they, they had worked with Elvis. They knew. But Jimmy Dean wasn't appreciated, you know, being out there like that. So Elvis, in a little while, come walking out of his room, coming down those steps, and Jimmy Dean was standing there next to the, the bar, and he saw him. He started walking towards him and said, I ought to rip a yard and a half out of your ass to keep me waiting this long. And the Elvis boy put that, took that gun out, put it right underneath him, chin, and said, I ought to shoot your damn brains out for even talking to me like that. And Dean was just like this here, and Elvis, <laughs> just kidding, Jimmy, and walked off. Yes, this was during the, the bad days of Las Vegas. Uh, this was toward the end of Las Vegas, where we went to, uh, on, started going back uh, on tours, got out, you know, he was tired of Las Vegas. And, he was really getting into the prescriptions and everything else. But this one particular time, uh, you know, we, we pretty well had to figure out when certain things should supposed to be happening. When he's going to get the shot to get up, and when he's going to get the shot to go to bed. And it was getting close to showtime. The phone rang. I didn't see anything going on. And uh, it was the colonel who said, well, you're going to be able to make it? And I said, Colonel, I don't think so. And boy, that was, uh, you're talking about pressure. Because you're talking about a showroom full of people. You gotta go down, somebody gotta go tell them that no show tonight. Uh, a lot of people ask questions about whether the Colonel, and, and the statement that he made, whether he knew whether Elvis was having problems or not, and taking stuff Certainly. and what have you. Oh, and certainly. he denies, yeah, but he says he didn't. Uh, and, really and, that, and that answers a whole lot of questions to a lot of people. Yeah. That he yeah, knew, by, just by calling up there asking. Colonel knows also, uh, he and I talked about it, because I was on the road in advance setting up security at the hotel and everything, so I went ahead of each show with Colonel Parker, and he told me, he said, Sonny, he's getting, he's getting worse, it seems. I said, he is, Colonel. He's getting worse about it. So uh, Colonel was well aware that Elvis had a problem. Even though Elvis continues to perform at sold-out concerts, loyal fans ignore the fact that the man who once gyrated across the stage can no longer fit into trademark jumpsuits. In 1973, Elvis and Priscilla divorce. Elvis finds comfort in a woman who would take care of him in the darker days to come, former model Linda Thompson. Linda was with him for four years, from 72 to 76, and, and all of the, most of that time, you know, she stayed the same all the time. She dressed flashy. I mean, Beautiful. Elvis loved, loved for her to dress that way. And, and um, yeah. And she went through, she, this was during a period of kind of going downhill. <coughs> she went through some stuff, and she probably saved his life. Uh, you know, we've always contended, had she been there at Graceland when Elvis died, that, uh, that he'd, she'd have checked on him, and it never would have happened. She'd have got in there in time. He had taken something one night in Las Vegas, and uh, what do you do? He'd take these big green bombs, man, a Placidel, plas 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 and after a while, probably more than that. And then he'd wait for them to hit, and he'd eat or read or whatever. And he loved to get that feeling, you know, he would just sit there and, and, and go to sleep. And of course, she was always there to, to put him to sleep, make sure he was asleep. Well, he was eating an apple. He was laying down one night, eating an apple, and it, it hit him. And the, what he had in his mouth got stuck in his throat. You know, he was, he was choking to death. And she happened to be there, flipped him over, and did whatever it took and knocked it out. You know, he was so, he was so. Uh, Wait, one second, more. I want these big green things that they're talking about for 750 Placidil, they're hypnotic. He's called him green football. Yeah, and that's what he was taking that would literally just knock him out. He could be eating, and it happens so quick when it hits, it's just within about 10 seconds, you go sound asleep. Go ahead, Lamar. He, uh, 
uh, Elvis was very, you know, because he's such an insomniac, he was very nocturnal. He'd get up and wander around at night, or, you know, he'd come in your room and crawl in bed and start talking to you. One night, he it came. It was just strange. Judy and I were in the room there. It was on a weekend when they had come over to visit, and everyone had gone. We'd been out in the suite earlier and everything, and then when they went, Elvis went to his room, and we went to ours, and Red and Pat, they went to their room, so we're back there, and all of a sudden, there's a little tentative knock on the door. And I knew who it was, because no one else knocked like that. Elvis just, and I said, honey, I said, that's him. That's him. She said, well, go to the door. I said, no, I, I think he wants to talk or something. Man, we'll be out there forever. If he's fought off those sleeping pills, he's going to be out there forever. And he knocked again. She said, honey, you can't. I said, OK, OK. So I went to the door. Oh. And it was Elvis. I said, hey, boy, he said, uh, y'all sleeping? And I said, no. I said, he said, uh, you think that uh, y'all could come out here and we could just sit and talk for a little while, you and Judy and everything? I said, sure. I said, sure. He said, oh, OK. And he left. I said, Judy, I shouldn't answer that door. I told you. So I put on my robe. I got my pajamas. I put on my robe. Judy puts on her robe and everything. And we go out there. And we're looking. He's not out there. No. He's not out there. And I said, well, where? In... I thought, did he go out that wrong door out to the elevators or what? So I went, and the door was cracked open. I said, Elvis? No answer. I said, honey, stay right here. I went in and looked around, boy, and there he was in bed, sound asleep. That quick, it hit yeah, him it from did. the time yeah. he thought, you know, he's going to fight him oh, and yeah. talk for a while, but they overcame him. And he got, I said, Judy, let's he, go. And I shut uh, the door and went back. That's bad. when he was like a little boy at times like that. Boy, that's when your heart just went out to him oh, and you sure. thought, God bless him, you want to take care of him. Well, mm. <laughs> You're on tour and he, he flew uh, somewhere? Oh, yeah, we were in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, undoubtedly it was something he wanted. I don't know, man. It, it, I, we had just got there, and he said, I, I need, I don't know what kind of medicine. He called it something for pain, but he said, I, I'm going to fly to Memphis. And I said, well, who are you going to see? I said, you got Dr. Nick here. And he said, I, he ain't got what I want. <laughs> 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 we got on the Lisa Marie, flew to Memphis, and I don't even know who the doctor was. I don't think Elvis knew who he was. He just picked somebody at random. <laughs> Mm. And we go into his office and all that, and he's seeing other patients at this time. So he's talking to him for a minute, and the doctor said, well, excuse me, Mr. Preston, I'll be right back. And all that, he said, I got, you know, a couple of patients I need to see. And he said, but I'll be right back, will you? He makes his round. While he makes his round, Elvis is going through his desk, and I mean, samples were going into this bag, boy, like you wouldn't believe. And he had a whole thing full of samples, and I don't have no idea what they were, but... I, he did. I mean, he read well, these he, things, he, and he, he, he knew, knew the exactly. medications. Uh, I mean, he had plushies over here. He smashed it up in his PDR you know? is what he did. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we did make it back, thank goodness, in time for the show. But this is, you know, this is some of the things of how bad he was actually getting, you know, I mean, at this time. Yeah, that's why I wanted you yeah. to bring that out, to see how bad the last year was. Uh, now, you're telling, last night you were talking about two times he almost checked out. Well, and one time he, they packed him in ice, and the other time was... Uh, Something yeah. else. It shot him in right, right here or something. He shot directly into his yeah. artery. Uh, anyway, we was in Palm Springs, and this, um, this is pretty close, really. This is, uh, this is late '76, and we had flew to Palm Springs, and he was seeing this little girl. Uh, really, he was seeing her for about the second time. Anyway, he got out there, and uh, he had taken a bunch of stuff, man. I don't know what all, because, you know, he when he did it, he went in his bathroom, and you never knew. Anyway, his breathing got real shallow. He'd go, and it seemed like it'd be a minute, minute and a half before he'd take that second breath. Well, the little girl that was with him panicked, and of course, she, you know, she run into our room, and she knocked on the door. I was out of it. I was sound asleep, because I pretty well wore out at this time, and my wife, she happened to be up, and Anyway, she goes in there, and he was still doing that same thing. He go, and that's the way it was. And then about a minute later, he'd take another one. It was almost like he wasn't getting his breath. And of course, I was getting just a little bit excited. And so she starts talking to him and trying to get him awake, and you know, actually patting him on the face and shaking him just a little bit, not a whole lot. You didn't, you didn't do that. You know, you don't want really to shock him. And she would get him to talking. 
We already pretty much had him, you know, kind of in focus a little bit by this time. But he he come real close. If the little girl hadn't have been there, I, I think he would have checked out then. I really do. Uh, the other time we were in Louisiana or North Carolina or somewhere, and he uh, he was just laying across the bed, and I I had gone in, and he was laying across the bed, and I said, you know, he's not moving. I said, you know, I, I shook him, and and I said. Uh, are you awake? And no reaction. And I, I said, look, and, and it says, I forgot who else is in the room. I said, go down and get Nick. And I ran down the hall and banged on the room. And, and I said, Nick and, and I think Nick and Joe in there with somebody, whoever it was. And I said, I need you right now. And he, he said, well, I'll be there in a minute. I said, no, now. I said, come here. I said, we got a big problem. Well, at that, he ran to the door and, uh, Went down to the hall. Went down the hall, and he went into the bedroom, and he gave me a shot straight into here with retlin or something like that, straight into his artery. To, and boy, he was like, it was like a John Travolta picture. He was straight up, just like I mean, just like that. He was out of it. Well, when we got off of that tour, we were home a few days, and that's when he had his dad call everybody. He called them, and then he called me, and he said, Vernon said, uh, Red, uh, We've got to cut back on some expenses here. We spend too much money, and uh, we're going to have to let some people go. And I, don't, I can't explain the feeling. I just felt empty after all these years, after all we'd gone through. But I knew, you know, I'd gone and come back, gone and come back. I knew I'd never go back. I knew this was it. It was over forever. I grew up with Elvis Presley. I grew up and became a middle-aged man with Elvis Presley. And then all of a sudden, it's over. I knew the drugs had him, and they were going to get him, and there was no turning back, and I felt sick. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to write a book about my life story, and it, you know, about, with Elvis. And in this book, oh, I was going to try one more time to wake this idiot up. And he called me, and we discussed the book. We had a long conversation, his own tape, and he said, do what you got to do, Red. And I did. Just, uh, I, man, I, all I've ever done is try to uh, maybe sometimes overprotect you. And I, that, that's the guy's truth. Mm. We well, you know what it is. Oh, I mean, that old guy said, cool, man, look. I hate you, you kid. Yeah. Well, that's the guy's truth. We, we sure have, we sure didn't communicate in the last year or so. Uh, just uh, you, you have been pretty fucked up. He was so wrong on one thing, uh, and, 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 and there's no depending on him because I'm just been talking to his friend. I was a private line in the fucking soul. Uh, right. Uh, I am not. After the publication of Red's book, Sonny West, Red's cousin and co-author, defends the tell-all book to reporters who question the motives of the friends and bodyguards. When we wrote this book, it was, it was out of bitterness and hurt to start with. I tell you, when we were given three days' notice by his father and a week's pay, after 16 years, 20 years, two and a half, three years with Dave, we all had families, and he wouldn't talk to us himself. He flew out of town, and he had his father do it. With Elvis's drug habit now in print, Sonny offers an explanation for the expose. 
do you mean by that? When I said maybe it will do some good for him, for the drug culture, for people to realize no one is out of reach of drugs, man. Here is a man that had it in the palm of his hand and started off with it that way, and the drugs took it away from him. We all knew that, uh, that how he was and knew that if you pushed too much, you were simply out. If you were out, how in the hell were you going to help him? That's right. Yeah. You know, we knew the situation, so we're in here trying to do what we can or what he'll allow Some you bows. to do. I mean, I, don't, I, can't, I can't explain to you how many pills I lifted that, that would simply be there, and I'd say, well, you know, while I'm at it, shove a few over here and take it and simply flush it. But if he didn't get that feeling, he knew something was wrong, so you had to work real careful. I mean, it's literally, let me say, that I stole from Elvis Presley. I did. I took pills and i take Placidils and drain them suckers with a needle and then blow air back into them to hold them up so, because it'd be too many. And that way I cut down as best I could. But if it, he didn't get that feeling, boy, he was somewhere getting them. So you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. When I first went to work for him, I was like 21 years old. And he was like the big brother that had been out there and, and seen part of the world and everything. And I was learning from him, and he was taking care of us. At the end, it had reversed, where he was like a little boy that had gone off and gotten some trouble. And now we were trying to help him out, pull him through it. Just almost a reversal of the roles, you know? By now, I was pretty well hooked. Just uh, like Red said, it wasn't no, it wasn't no going back. And Elvis, be honest with you, was totally wore out. Mm -hmm. Totally. No. And Ginger came on the scene. Ginger Alder. Ginger is a very pretty woman. And she was young. Here's a 22-year-old that's got a lifestyle that she likes. And here's a 42-year-old that had done everything in the world. And not too much interested him anymore. I mean, he had done it all. I mean, you know, whatever you name, he would probably had done it. And he asked me one night, he said, he said, what is it? He said, he said, she, she acts like she don't want to be around sometimes. I said, Ginger likes showing you off. The fact that she's going with you, she wants her family to meet you, her friends to meet you, this is her way. And she enjoys nightclubs, she enjoys pool parties. I said, all the things you've already done. I said, now, in order to hold her, you've got to give a little. I mean, you've got to go to her lifestyle and not so much expect her to do all yours. And I've, I've experienced a whole year of him and Ginger, and I am sick to the bone of it. And I told my wife, I said, I said, man, I said, I am sick of it. I'm tired of it. I said, I wish he would ditch her, get somebody else. I said, but you, nothing you say seems to change his mind. And I said, you know, I, I, I've just about had it. I said, I just can't handle it. She said, look, I never will forget that because it stood out. She said, she said, just bear with him. She said, because, you know, we might not have him long. Uh, he had gone to, to the dentist to have a crown redone. After that, we came back to Graceland, and he went upstairs with Ginger. And, and uh, I didn't find out till later what it was, because he normally, you know, he's up this time and he's wanting to do things, you know. So I asked him, I said, you gonna be up there? He said, yeah. He said, I'll, I'll probably call it a night, which was unusual. So about, uh, I guess about 4 o'clock in the morning, I got this phone call, and he said, would you and Joe come out here? I said, oh, me and Ginger want to go down and play some racquetball. So we got dressed, and we go out there and meet him and go to the, <coughs> to the racquetball building he's got on his property, had one built. And we're starting to play racquetball. Anyway, he kept, I kept hitting the ball. You almost had to hit it right to Elvis, because he was not going to move, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's just that simple. So, I'd hit the ball to him, and instead of him trying to hit the ball back, he was trying to hit me with it. And a couple of times succeeded. And boy, that when he hit it hard, that ball would sting the fool out of you. <laughs> so this one time, boy, 
I hit it real hard, and he swung at it. Boy, I mean, he was going to lay it on me this time, but he swung it, he missed it, and he hit himself on the shin. Oh. <laughs> well, he hollered, and here he goes limping out, and he sat down, and he started to raise his, his pants leg. When he did, I said, is it bleeding? He said, I don't think so, and I reached and got it, pulled it back down. I said, hell, if it ain't bleeding, it ain't hurting. <laughs> and he, of course, he threw the racket at me at that time. <laughs> and then he got on the piano, and he was, he was playing the piano, and all out, he sang some gospel song just uh, briefly, you know, just part of it. And then he got on Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain, and uh, he, he played that, and he pretty much went all the way through that one. And then I had asked him about Ginger, see, because it was strange for him to come from the dentist's office and stay in his room that long and then call me later. I knew something wasn't right. I knew he wasn't going to go to bed. So I asked him, I said, look, I said, what was wrong? I said, you know, Ginger came upstairs, and I said, later you called me, you know, play ragball. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, oh, hell, so she's not going on the first part of this tour. And he said, that reminds me. He said, you remember that little girl I took to Palm Springs? I said, yeah. He said, get in touch with her. I want her to go on the first part of the tour. And then before Ginger gets there, we'll send her back. So I said, OK. And we went up, you know, got a, he got up. We went back to the house. And we go upstairs. And uh, uh, Joe waited downstairs. My wife waited downstairs for me. We go in the bathroom, and he's wanting me to wash and dry his hair. And that's as close to a bath at that time as he got. Then we're talking about the tour, and, and I said, well, I said, are you up for the tour? And he said, yeah. He said, I, he said I'm, I'm pretty well up for it. He said, uh, it's probably going to be one of the best tours I'll ever do. And really, what he's doing is psyching himself up. You know, I, really, I was glad to hear it, you know. So talk a while, and then after that, I, I, I leave. I go in the house, I ain't thinking nothing about it. I mean, we just had a, a fairly good time, you know, and he and kind of got me, he was kind of up. You, you know, I, I had no earthly idea, you know, what was going to take place in a few hours later. Somewhere around 1.30, if I'm not mistaken, the phone rang, and it was my cousin Patsy, and, and she's totally broke down, and she said, Elvis is dead, uh, and... Just like that, I said, Patsy, well, I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, calm down a little bit. I said, and tell me what's wrong. She said, well, they've, they've taken him to the hospital. and said, he's dead. I said, Patsy, I said, now, we've, we've done this a lot of times. I said, you know, this ain't the first time. I said, it's probably just another one of those situations where he couldn't breathe good. And I said, he'll, he'll be all right. And to me, you know, I mean, I could never imagine Elvis dead. I mean, the man was bigger than life to me. So she insisted that he was dead. So I hung the phone up, and, and I told, told my wife, I said, I got to go to the hospital. I said, Elvis is in the hospital. And she said, what's wrong? I said, well, Patsy says he's dead. I said, but you know, maybe when we get there, everything will be, you know, OK. So I ran out of the house. And the only thing I could think about was jumping on my motorcycle. I had to get there, and I didn't care how, you know. And when I went in, Charlie and Joe were standing there. and. Uh, and Charlie grabbed me, and he said, he's, he's gone, he's gone. And Joe said, and he was crying, and he said, he, you know, he said, Elvis is gone this time. I said, no, man, I said, it can't be. I said, where's Dr. Nick? He said, he's in the other room with him. I said, well, then there's, you know, there's still a hope here. And about that time, the door opened, and Dr. Nick, he walked out, and he's got these tears running down his eyes. And he reached and grabbed me, and he said, he's gone. He said, do you want to see him? And I said, I don't think so. I just got mad at him because he died. I said, you, you, you had no right. I said, you deprived everybody of a lot of good things. And I said, you had no right to die. I wanted to jerk him up out of the casket and shake him. You know, I just, uh, I just felt like he didn't have a right to die. I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't think it was right. His ways have affected us. Always will. Oh, we still we, like, we pattern a lot of our ways after him, you know. We, you know, we just, uh, everything, I guess outside of my father, he was the closest thing I had. And uh, when we lost him, we sort of all lost part of ourselves. We never, 
ever recovered. We all do something every day like he did. It, we all we all do things like he did, and we can't help it. It's just part of our lives, and it's not easy. We still miss him a lot, an awful lot. Even if we wanted to, which none of us do, to cut him out from inside, we can't. We don't know any better. We just, you know, we, we, you know, we, we grew up, you know, around him, and, and the things we do sometimes are, are not right. But you know, this. What else do we know? Yeah. You know. One thing I'll say is. What else do we this, know? This helps me a lot. I will see him again. Yeah. I will see him. I'm sure we'll have to get an appointment. <laughs> if there's any way and Elvis ever had a doubt that we cared for him, I think this right here, if he's able to, out there somewhere to visualize it or see it, the doubt's gone. Oh, yeah. That's it's, got, it's got to be gone. It's funny. Uh, uh, okay, it's been 20 years now, almost. And it started out with a little group. Others came along. Others came along. They've all gone, but the, the original group is sitting right here. Mm -hmm. We were part of something unique. We, d we didn't even realize what we were a part of until after it was gone. And uh, we spent a lifetime with a legend from the time we were kids uh -huh. until we were grown men. And uh, it was a hell of an experience. 